uh, first first passage of scripture. Uh, you can turn to Daniel chapter 12. It'll take us a while to get there, but if you're wanting to open up to a particular passage first, you can open up there while we're getting ready. Oh, let's see how settled we are. I see people are making use of the big comfy chairs that have been brought in. By the way, thank you for bringing, I'm guessing you guys brought them in, right? Yeah. So, thank you for that. All right. Well, how about uh, before we get into the actual sermon, how about we have a time of prayer and then we'll go from there. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> oh, Father, um, I come to you, you know, kind of first and foremost, I ask your help um, as I, you know, come to you know, preach something about the resurrection of Christ and hopefully something that will be helpful to all those who are here, something that will show a little more of his glory, something that will open the eyes of the blind for any here who don't yet see the glory of your son and don't yet believe in him as they ought to believe in him. Uh, but one way or another, I ask your help just for me to be faithful and clear and truly helpful to everyone that's gathered here today. Uh, we just really do ask for this whole meeting to glorify you, and we ask you to be present among us for that purpose. And so, you know, as we uh, proceed on from here, whether in the sermon or the time afterward, in the meal time, we do ask your help, and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, Today, I would like to spend our time considering the resurrection of Christ, you know, which happened you know, about 2,000 years ago as of today. So, of course, that is very common for us to do that, at least whenever you know, I am preaching on these Easter Sundays. Yeah, but it's kind, of, it's kind of important, you know, it's the resurrection of Jesus. It's the event that uh, secured our salvation and confirmed the work that was uh, done by God in Christ. Because of the resurrection of Christ, we know that God was pleased with Christ when he died on the cross under the wrath of God to pay the penalty for our sins. You know, resurrection is you know, very much the stamp of approval that God approved of Christ as a righteous man doing his work. Because of the resurrection, we know that Christ lives to stand in the presence of God for us, interceding for us, ruling heaven and earth for the good of his people. You know, staying dead would have done him no good and done us no good as well, right? So a live dog is better than a dead lion, as I think one of the Proverbs says. So Jesus was raised up to fill that role for us before God. And because of the resurrection of Christ, we have a living hope that we too will be like him, raised up from the dead at the end of the age to live in his, praise, in, live in his presence uh, in righteousness forever. And, you know, the, the whole thing of eternal life, living forever, if there is any great goal to which humanity might aspire, it is that. But in Christ, we already have it, and we have the guarantee of it because he has done it. He walked out of that grave, and there's a promise implied there that those that follow him will have a similar resurrection and a similar glory at the end of the age. So for all those reasons, I do like to spend these Easter Sundays dwelling on the resurrection of Jesus in particular. It's very worthy of our attention and the kind of thing that uh, saying too much about it doesn't seem possible. There's always something else. And on that note, I can say that I'm in no danger really of running out of sermons to preach about the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, so I've done this for several years now and I don't see that faltering anytime, anytime soon. On the other hand, I may very well be in danger of running thin on the more traditional Easter sermons. And perhaps that is not a surprise to much of you who are often here. You know that I very often come out with these very strange things that maybe are a bit unusual, but all hopefully helpful and honoring to God in their own way. And as you can indicate, I'm kind of getting into one of those sermons today. <clears throat> 
uh, whenever things like this happen where I uh, find myself, you know, plowing through the ideas I have, I usually find myself in this category of thoughts that I call things that keep me awake at night. As I've also talked about in the past, things that just have me really thinking for a long time and trying to get my thoughts straight on certain things that God has shown me or that I've stumbled across. And for this year's Easter sermon, I've selected one of those kinds of topics, you know, one of those things that have been uh, kind of a nagging thought for me. I can say that I no longer lose sleep about this one because I feel like I've arrived at something that is actually worth sharing and actually very substantive. So today I'm doing that sort of thing. Uh, I have plenty of useful comments, I hope, uh, to make about it uh, regarding the resurrection of Christ. So today I want to argue that the resurrection of Christ fulfills a very ancient human desire for a resurrected God, which is a very, very precise thing to say in a lot of ways, uh, but I mean every word of that. I tried very hard to find out how to summarize what I'm actually saying after I wrote out all these notes, but that's it, that Christ fulfills a very ancient and human desire for a resurrected God. And my thoughts on this topic began years ago, really as an attempt to answer an objection really that gets raised against Christianity by certain unbelievers. And again, a lot of you that know me well know that I'm always kind of in that sort of thing, you know, trying to figure out, it's like, okay, here's what the unbelievers are saying. What kind of answer do we give to that? And is it worth pursuing in that regard? Well, the objection from those unbelievers is based, just so you know where this is going, it's based on similarities between the gospel and some of the much older myths told by pagans, right? So you go back before Christianity, you have all these people worshiping their false gods and have their mythologies kind of dedicated to those gods. And then Christianity comes along and just kind of takes over for to a large degree throughout much of the world. Uh, but some people have pointed out that some aspects of our gospel, specifically today, the resurrection of Jesus, has some things in common to some of those older myths, and they kind of cry foul at that in some way. So I spent a lot of time in the past really thinking about that and what sort of things you might say about that, how accurate their objection is. And when I finished it, <coughs> excuse me, goodness, voice is already cutting out. This, isn't, this doesn't bode well, right, for an hour-long sermon. When I finished answering their objection to some degree, I came to see the resurrection of Jesus in a very fresh way, not usually considered, but very weighty, I think. So there's more to say beyond just answering an objection from a bunch of skeptics. Uh, and that's really where I'm going today with this. So my sermon today is called The Desire of Nations, which is a phrase that maybe is familiar to you as a description of Jesus, but which I plan to load with some maybe new content for you uh, throughout the course of this sermon. And my outline has four headings, and as I always like to do, I like to tell you where I'm going with all of this so you can follow along a little more easily. Uh, so first, uh, first heading, unbelievers occasionally criticize the resurrection of Jesus for being a retelling of older myths. So that's the actual objection that gets my thoughts going on this topic. And in this heading, we'll talk about you know, what they're actually pointing to in these pagan mythologies that came before Christianity. Secondly, I will observe, as is often the case, uh, these unbelievers fail to notice all the important facts about Jesus. In other words, they have a very uh, selective set of facts that they're dealing with. They're not really in incorporating everything that they need to be thinking about. Very common problem among people who object in this way. So I want to I want to set those things straight in that second heading. Thirdly, uh, if we view the resurrection of Jesus with an open mind, we can actually give a better explanation for these ancient myths. In other words, I plan to turn the tables a little bit, and instead of saying that uh, the gospel is explained by these ancient myths, I'm going to say the ancient myths are explained by the gospel. In other words, uh, another variation of Jesus is the answer, right? And then finally, Last heading, based on all of this, uh, we can argue that the resurrection of Jesus is worthy of our faith. I'm sure that many of you here will not dispute that claim, that the resurrection of Jesus is worthy of our faith, but maybe we can give some new reasons 
uh, for why his resurrection is worthy of our belief. So that's where we will end this particular sermon. And perhaps this sermon is a little more on the academic side, especially toward the beginning where I have to just kind of uh, throw a whole bunch of facts at you uh, that are not usually available just from like a normal education. Uh, so definitely leaning a bit more on the academic side of things. Nonetheless, my purpose today, as I've said a few times already, is to glorify God through the unique glory of Christ and his resurrection. And on the one hand, when I hear people saying that the resurrection of Christ and, and the glory of Christ are not unique, I get a rather, uh, I get a bit hostile to them because, you know, it's like, ah, oh, you know, Jesus is my savior too, right? He's my Lord. So I definitely want to defend, if we can speak of defending uh, such a person as Jesus, I certainly want to defend Christianity, at least against those kinds of claims, but then also go a little bit further and show how even in that, you know, there is stuff that God would have us know and believe and understand uh, that's maybe worth knowing and worth throwing into the mix here as we talk about Jesus and his resurrection. So I hope you will receive this sermon with a similar attitude as I have in writing it and delivering it, just having another look at the glory of Christ. So, you know, taking the resurrection of Jesus and maybe turning it this way and looking at it from another direction. That's basically what we're doing here today, what I'm doing here today. All right, so let's begin with the first heading that I indicated to you. I need to begin with more of an explanation of what these unbelievers are saying. And maybe this is not new to some of you. I mean, this, this kind of argument has been around for a while, but you know, I, I never like to assume that people know what I'm talking about, so I'm just going to lay it all out here. So unbelievers occasionally criticize the resurrection of Jesus for being a retelling of older myths. And that's the word there, retelling. So take it, you know, change the details a little bit and you know, give it a bit of a different spin. So uh, I think we're familiar with that, with the kinds of movies we watch. It seems like every movie is a remake of some earlier movie. Some skeptics claim that the whole story of the resurrection of Jesus is a remake, a retelling of previous mythology. And to show you what I mean, I'm going to briefly summarize three of these myths. And believe me, it is really strange to be standing up here on Easter Sunday retelling pagan mythology as the first thing in my Easter sermon. It feels weird to me for sure. But it's a necessary step to get to where we need to get to today. So I am going to start with that. I've got three here that are probably used more commonly than others as an example of, you know, these resurrected gods from pagan mythology that you will sometimes hear people talk about. So let's start with an Egyptian myth about one of their gods, Osiris. Okay, so Egypt, of course, one of the most ancient of civilizations with a very, very detailed mythology uh, of their own. And this one about one of their gods, a god named Osiris. So as the story goes, Osiris had a brother named Set. And Set really did not like his brother Osiris at all and straight up murdered Osiris. So we're already, you know, starting right here with a death. Uh, so Set murders his brother Osiris and didn't just murder him, but basically split his body into pieces. So he really wanted him dead. It was like, like this is, you know, pagan mythology and at its finest right here. We got brother killing brother in a very gruesome way. Well, thankfully... Osiris had a wife named Isis who did not want her husband dead. Uh, very fortunate for him. So Isis gathers together the pieces of Osiris's body so that he can live again. He's going to kind of put him, she's going to put him back together again. And Isis has help from this other god named Anubis who actually made Osiris into a mummy. Of course, the Egyptians are known for making mummies. In their mind, this is kind of the beginning of that. Osiris was the first mummy in that regard. And because he was mummified, Osiris came back to life. So this is where we get to a resurrection of Osiris coming back to life. And because he had been both dead and alive, Osiris, in the Egyptian way of thinking, became king of the afterlife and actually made it possible for others to have an afterlife because he kind of plowed the way forward. He was the pioneer, you know, getting people into life after death. Now, the Egyptians did not believe in a resurrection of the body, so to speak, like we read about in the scriptures, uh, but they did think of uh, preserving the body as a mummy, as a way to preserve the soul 
for a life after death. Uh, so they did very much have that idea, and that's why mummification and all of that is so important. You see all the Egyptian pictures of them preparing the body and all the ways that they did. That's why they go through that trouble. Uh, very unique to them in their own way. So based on all of that, you might say, Osiris was raised from the dead, inherited a kingdom, and made a way for eternal life. All of which sounds kind of similar to Christianity, right? It's like, so you can kind of see how they're building this argument about Jesus just being kind of retelling of earlier stories. That's one example. Let's do another example. I've got three of these, remember. Second example of myths of resurrected gods, let's talk about Ishtar and Tammuz. All right, so two gods from Sumer. And if you're wondering where Sumer is, if you know where Iraq is on the world map, Sumer is kind of in the south part of that. So very much this Middle Eastern area, but that's where Sumer was located, another very ancient civilization with its own mythology. And if the two names Ishtar and Tammuz sound familiar, those of you that have been reading your Old Testaments, you will actually recognize those names because those are two of the false gods that do occasionally get mentioned uh, in the Old Testament. Probably Ishtar is the more common of the two, but they're both mentioned there. Uh, so you might actually recognize those names. But what's the story? Okay, why are these these resurrected gods? Okay, well, let's tell the story here. The story begins with Ishtar, who's the goddess. She's a woman, right? And she dies. She goes to the underworld, but manages to escape the underworld back to the land of the living. So this is already in itself kind of a resurrection, right? She dies, goes to the underworld, but she makes it back. She makes a great escape. I don't know how she pulled that off, but apparently she did, according to this story. The problem is she doesn't get off entirely free because Ishtar is pursued by these demon-like creatures who want to bring her back to the underworld because, hey, once you're here, you can't leave. That's the rule. you got to come back. Well, Ishtar is uh, pretty good with her words, and she manages to convince them to take somebody else in her place. All right, so she's now dealing with someone else's life uh, for her own sake, kind of selfish on her part, but this is her plan. And the demons agree to that. So who is she going to send in her place? Well, Ishtar learns that her husband, Tammuz, has not been properly mourning her death. He's, in fact, been living it up. You know, he's got you know, feasting and all kinds of other women around him. He's like living it up after her death. And she does not like that one bit. So she says, take my husband Tammuz. He'll go in my place. So they do that. So Tammuz goes to the underworld in her place. But then Ishtar apparently is not that hard hearted because she kind of regrets this action. So she goes to cut another deal. And the deal she cuts is this. Tammuz will spend half the year in the underworld and then the other half of the year with her in the land of the living, right? And this is actually uh, the Sumerian explanation for the seasons, right? For as long as Tammuz is in the underworld, it's autumn and winter. When he gets out, that's spring and summer. That's how they explain the, the changing of the seasons throughout. But notice we have a story here, two resurrected gods, not just one. And one of them was even a substitute the, to purchase the life of another, which again seems kind of like Christian thought, right? Jesus took our place, you know, took our sins upon him, took our place on the cross, and through him we have life. So again, one of these other pagan myths that seem very similar to what the gospel would later say. Well, let's finish with one more example, then we'll move on from all of this uh, pagan mythology and get into some truth. Uh, so here's this last example. This is a Greek example, okay? So Greek mythology is usually a bit more well-known, uh, so maybe this might be a bit more familiar. Let's talk about one of their gods, Dionysius. Okay, so Dionysius, the best way to explain Dionysius, he was the Greek god of everything that most people consider fun. All right, so especially wine, lots of wine. Dionysius is the god of grapes and, and preparing it into wine and drinking that wine and having fun with that wine. But then everything else that comes from that, you know, he's the god of party animals, if you want to put it that way. Now, Dionysius was also the son of Zeus, right? So Zeus being the chief god of the Greek mythology and Dionysius being one of his sons, that puts Dionysius pretty high up there, right? And on top of that, Zeus loved Dionysius so much that he wanted to make him his heir in case anything should happen to Zeus. Because you got to remember in these pagan mythologies, gods can die. We've seen a lot of them die already this morning. 
And Zeus basically says, hey, if anything happens to me, Dionysius takes over. He's the man in charge. I can't imagine what that would be like for a guy like Dionysius to take over, but that was the plan, which, as you can imagine, uh, didn't make the other gods very happy. You know, they were jealous of Dionysius. They didn't like him. And what happens when gods get jealous of people that are related to them? They kill him, right? They're just going to kill this guy, Dionysius, and again, split his body into pieces. I don't know why they keep doing that. Uh, but it's a very common theme in these ancient myths, but they do that. The other gods get together, they kill Dionysius, and now he is dead. But the mother of Dionysius, uh, again, very similar to stuff we've already seen, gathers the pieces of his body together and brings him back to life. So again, a resurrected god. This time, this time you might say it's a beloved son of God coming back to life, because again, Dionysius is the favorite son of Zeus. So again, very similar ideas here. And after that, Dionysius had an illustrious career uh, teaching mankind how to party, basically. So it just kind of goes on from there. But that's how that myth runs. Now, that's, that's enough nonsense for now. I think we've established the point that the skeptics, at least, are trying to make. In short, we can find several examples, and there's even more than these three. I'm just choosing the three that are perhaps most commonly mentioned. But several examples of these pagan gods being resurrected according to these ancient myths that people would tell before Christianity came along. And among skeptics of Christianity, it is widely believed that the resurrection of Christ is simply a retelling of older myths like these. And I've pointed out to you as I've gone through here, there are some similarities, even beyond the mere fact of a God dying and being resurrected. There are some other themes there that seem very much like later Christian themes. And of course, in saying that the gospel is a copycat story, uh, the skeptics mean to argue that Christ is no more worthy of our faith than gods like Osiris, Tammuz, or Dionysius. And that's very much the argument they make. It's like you come to them trying to tell them about Jesus and the good news of the gospel, and they're like, ah, oh, well, I might as well believe in Osiris or something like that. And that's very much the response a lot of people have to Christianity, at least among people that are familiar with these uh, ancient myths. So definitely looking more at the scholarly side of the world, but nonetheless a very real objection that people raise. All right, well now that we see the evidence that they bring and the way they interpret that evidence, let's ask how well they interpret that evidence and apply it to the resurrection of Jesus. Because again, uh, it's not, this is a very common problem. You know, people come with maybe a set of evidence and they just sort of treat it as conclusive in itself. But evidence doesn't actually say anything by itself. It's how you interpret it that matters. And sometimes there's more than one way to look at these things. And so that's what I want to do here eventually. But as part of that, we actually need to broaden the amount of evidence because there are other things here that are being totally left out. And this is also a very common theme that I've noticed among people that raise objections to Christianity they may not bring everything that is actually relevant to the table. And you have to do some digging of your own to find out what more needs to be there to help you make sense of these things. So specifically, I have three observations that I want to make as a bit of a correction, or the first part of my correction. So let's talk about this. And here we can actually get into some scripture and not just you know pagan myths, because I'm tired of pagan myths. Let's talk about scripture. So first and foremost, the resurrection of Jesus connects much better with Jewish hopes for a general resurrection, not pagan myths. If we're going to talk about, if we're going to speak of a source for the idea of the resurrection of Jesus, it's not pagan mythology primarily, not by a long shot. It is definitely the Jewish hope for a resurrection. And we see through the Old Testament that Israel held to an idea very unique to them that God was going to raise up all the dead at the end of the age. Not just raise up their spirits, but raise up their bodies. And just to give you a passage that represents this probably better than some would, Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 through 3. Uh, this is why I had you turn to Daniel as a first passage, right? Here is one of these statements made by Daniel. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And those who have insight 
will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. All right, so there you go. One of these promises of a resurrection for all people, but an especially glorious resurrection for those who are righteous. Now, when the first Christians began preaching that Jesus had been raised from the dead, nobody, at least no Jew, would have thought they were copycatting pagan myths. That wasn't even on their mind. They're thinking of a very different sort of resurrection as they hear about Jesus being resurrected. Everybody, including the apostles, was thinking in terms of the general resurrection taught by Jews. They were thinking back to passages like this one in Daniel and other you know, scriptures about it and other traditions the Jews had developed about this resurrection and what it would be like. And sometimes in the New Testament, we are expressly told that the resurrection of Jesus was the beginning of that general resurrection. I have another passage for you, just one of the ones that is, again, uh, somewhat clear on this point. Something that Paul wrote, uh, this is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 24. And this chapter, of course, is very dedicated to this idea of the resurrection. Uh, so Paul certainly gets into some details about this here. But to start in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, he writes this, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming, and then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. All right, so the first fruits. So if you're a farmer, the first of your crops that you can gather up, they were supposed to be kind of a special offering to God among the Jews. Those were called the first fruits. And so Jesus is portrayed as the first fruits of the resurrection. So this great resurrection is coming, and Jesus is the beginning of that. They expressly in the New Testament link the resurrection of Jesus to the previous Jewish hopes for a general resurrection from the dead. When people try to reframe Jesus as a copy of pagan resurrected gods, they entirely ignore the culture in which Jesus was born, in which he ministered, and in which his resurrection was first proclaimed. That is a huge miss. I mean, strike number one I'm on their record here for trying to spin this theory of Jesus just being an imitation of resurrected gods. Like maybe in the wider world that might have been an issue, but in Israel, there was only one resurrection they were thinking of, and Jesus was the first fruits of that resurrection. Now my second observation uh, that I have here as a correction is that the resurrection of Jesus happens in history. It's very, very different from a myth. History is way different. In the case of the pagan myths, like practically all pagan myths, uh, those gods who allegedly rose from the dead in the way described, they rose from the dead once upon a time, or long ago in a galaxy far, far away, or however you want to word that. Like, there's no specific uh, date, no specific place, and certainly no evidence ever provided. It's not the kind of thing you can record or test. Uh, you can't, you know, find out more about the truth through interviews or by digging in the dirt or anything like that. None of that is possible with these myths. They happen totally in the realm of myth, which is kind of its own thing. Meanwhile, the ministry of Christ and his resurrection are firmly rooted in history. There's a time, there's a place, and in some sense, there's evidence you can test on this sort of thing. Very different flavor. Now, Luke, in his gospel, uh, gives us a rough date for the beginning of John's ministry. So John the Baptist comes right before Jesus to prepare the way for Jesus, and then Jesus begins his ministry. And Luke is kind enough to give us a date for when these things began to take place. So this is Luke chapter 3 if you're wanting to turn there. And this is throwing a bunch of names and places at you, which is not exactly the most stimulating reading, but for what we're doing right now, 
Very important. Luke chapter 3, let's read verses 1 through 3. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was Tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was Tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Anyone living in that time and place would have known where and when that was. A lot of those names and places are a bit obscure to us. Uh, some of them are very well known. Tiberius Caesar, I mean, he ruled the most powerful nation in the world at that time. In the 15th year, this is when that stuff started happening. And he provides you all these other names and when they were reigning and where uh, as further correlation. So if you lived back then and were familiar with these names and these places, you know exactly when and where this stuff happened with Jesus. There's no doubt in your mind. This is history. This is a historical thing that is being told to you. Now, as for Jesus, his resurrection came with a degree of evidence to it. As many as 500 witnesses at once saw him after his resurrection. Paul mentions that detail in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, which is quite a claim to make. And you can imagine, I think in, when Peter is preaching, uh, or maybe it was Paul, somewhere in the book of Acts, these things were not done in a corner. Like, yeah, there was a lot of people that saw this go down. And among those witnesses who saw Jesus, you have the 12 apostles who are most notable, mainly because they died for their testimony. I mean, a lot of these people died as martyrs in deaths that are not very comfortable. And really, all they had to do was renounce what they were saying about the resurrection of Jesus, and, that would have been the, and they would have been able to live you know, or maybe die a little more comfortably. But no, they held fast to the end and were just tortured and killed by the end of their lives for this. I mean, that is strong testimony. And let's not forget that the 12 could point to an empty tomb and a missing body which no one could locate, even though the rulers of Jerusalem certainly wished to find that body and prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. I mean, I've talked about this before in previous sermons, uh, about just the evidence of the resurrection. The only way to make sense of the stuff happening and the stuff that did not happen at that time is to say that Jesus really did rise from the dead. His body was gone. No one could find it. And the only explanation is the one actually given, that he rose from the dead and appeared to his apostles and sent them out as preachers to herald the coming of his kingdom. The resurrection of Jesus was presented from the beginning as history and not myth, which is a huge difference from talking about Osiris and Tammuz and Dionysius. It's an entirely different flavor. And whoever seeks to judge the resurrection of Jesus must do so by the standards of judging history, not myth. It's not enough to say, well, they're kind of similar. That's not going to do it. If you're going to judge this, you have to go in and do the historical legwork the same way a, his, a professional historian might do when he is testing his sources and you know, trying to figure out what really happened. That's a necessary step. You can't just ignore that. Well, finally, I have one more observation, again, as a correction to these uh, unbelievers who, who want to say that the resurrection of Jesus is just a retelling of myths. One more observation. The unbelievers on this point cannot explain why the resurrection of Jesus and only his resurrection has gained a worldwide faith and a worldwide following, which is perhaps the most abstract of all the details I'm going to be sharing with you, but it's one that I think cannot be ignored. So let's ask this question. Who worships Osiris? Does anyone in Egypt even worship Osiris anymore? Who worships Tammuz? I mean, the people that are most likely to know about Tammuz these days are people who read the Old Testament, which means they're not worshiping Tammuz, they're worshiping the real God. And who worships Dionysius? Again, is there anyone even in Greece that worships Dionysius anymore? Their worshipers died out 1,500 years ago or further back than that. They're just gone. I mean, no one worships, no one worships these gods anymore. And in their own time, uh, the worship of those gods never extended far. 
they were mostly national gods. Osiris was worshipped in Egypt, and Tammuz was worshipped in Sumer. Dionysius had a wider following because Greek culture was a little more hip in those days, but still we're talking Eastern Mediterranean world. So not worldwide by any means. Meanwhile, here comes the carpenter of Nazareth, you know, who steals all their worshipers and steals the worshipers of every other god ever invented on the earth and has been doing it for 2,000 years and is still doing it as the gospel continues to spread into the remote corners of the world. And the question I want to ask and the question we need to ask is why? If I lived back then and I had to gamble, which of these resurrected gods might spread beyond their homelands to the ends of the earth, I would have bet on Dionysius, to be honest with you. I mean, just think about this. Greek culture was very highly regarded. The Romans conquered Greece with their army, and then the Greeks conquered Rome with their culture. How does that happen? I mean, aren't, didn't the Romans prove they were the superior culture? I guess not. The Greeks conquered them and everybody else throughout that whole part of the world, Everyone wanted to be Greek, and Dionysius himself is a fun god. Eat, drink, and be merry. What more could you want? Right? What more could a worldly person want who thinks like a normal, ordinary person? Doesn't that sound like a fine god to worship? And yet still, Dionysius, the worship of Dionysius was still limited to that part of the world. People in China never worshipped Dionysius. Native Americans never worshipped Dionysius. Those scientists down in Antarctica who work there for some part of time, they're not worshiping Dionysius. Like, no one is. And his worship didn't even extend very far. Instead, a condemned criminal from a conquered nation has conquered millions of people on every continent, in almost every nation, and all under the name Lord and God. Right? That is what has happened. Jesus has totally taken the place of all the other gods, including the gods we covered this morning, including the gods who, in a sense, might be better gods in the, world, in, in the eyes of the worldly people. And again, the question I ask is, why? How does this happen? If the resurrection of Jesus is truly nothing more than a copy of a copy of a copy, then why is he brighter and clearer than any other resurrected god? That's not how it works. You make a copy of a copy of a copy, it gets faded. Things break down, it just doesn't work as well. Jesus triumphs, like he just totally sweeps away everything else. That's not how these things work. In worldly terms, things grow stale. You know, people give up on telling this kind of story and they start telling a different kind of story because they want something new. Jesus is ever fresh, even though he's apparently just a retelling of earlier myths. How does that work? How could that work? The fact is, the power behind the resurrection of Christ has nothing to do with human storytelling, but divine power. And I defy anyone to give a better explanation than that for how Jesus has conquered the nations in the way he has. You just can't explain it any other way. And based on all those observations, you know, we can see how misguided uh, those people are who treat the resurrection of Jesus as just kind of a hand-me-down myth. You know, it sounds like it might have some meat to it at first when they first, you know, spin their theory to you, but when you throw in these other details, there's just no way that's what happened. And yet, after all of that, uh, we still need to comment on this recurring theme about resurrected gods, which is a very real trend in mythology. You know, I gave you three pretty good examples, and there are even more examples I could have given you. I mean, this is something that does appear in ancient mythology and then gets replaced by Christianity and the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, but it was there for a long time, for centuries before Jesus. We have to comment on that. But I think if we view the resurrection of Jesus with an open mind, we can actually give better explanations for these ancient myths. We can come to this with the eyes of faith, you know, fully and firmly believing in Jesus as the resurrected Lord, and look back on these earlier myths and actually say something substantial that I think makes a lot more sense than what the skeptics are saying. And I want to do that. I want to give you three explanations. And uh, they all work together, so you don't have to choose one of the three. 
Uh, they all work together to show you, I think, in a sense, just how much fuller the resurrection of Jesus actually is. So let me get into these. My first explanation is evangelistic. Uh, so with regard to the preaching of the gospel and making converts for Jesus. My first explanation is evangelistic in that myths about resurrected gods prepared the nations to hear about the resurrection of Jesus. So that's the argument I'm making here, that these, in the providence of God and in his wisdom, these ancient myths serve something of a purpose in preparing the way for the gospel. Now, if we view history with the eye of faith, we can see that God was busy before Christ came preparing the way for the gospel. And this is something you'll hear people other than me talk about. This is actually somewhat common to make these observations. Let's think about some things. The Greek language was universally known in that part of the world, in that part of the world, at the time that the Christianity was beginning to spread. That's really good for preaching. If you're a Christian preacher trying to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, it's really helpful that anywhere you go in your lifetime, you can find somebody who can understand Greek. And if you can preach in Greek, they can hear in Greek and they can believe. That's enormously helpful. And it's amazing that God did that to really prepare the way for the gospel. Also, Roman roads allowed for easy travel, which is really good for missionaries. Again, if you're one of these guys like Paul going around everywhere trying to spread Christianity, it's really helpful to have really well-made roads that go practically everywhere that you would want to go. Very helpful. And again, God in his providence really did prepare the way for the spread of the gospel. Jews were scattered east and west of Israel due to earlier aspects of their history, which means if you're again a preacher of the gospel, go to any town, find the local synagogue, and you can find a group of people who are already somewhat prepared to hear about the coming of the Jewish Messiah. And there are probably Gentiles there too who have been interested in Judaism, and now they're going to hear the gospel. We see that with Paul over and over again. Very useful. Again, God was busy before the resurrection of Jesus in creating all these different things that made the world around Israel in particular ready for the gospel. But God did more than that. Let's press it further and see what else God might have been doing. People already had in their religions and their mythologies notions like God, sin, and atonement, right? And aren't those big parts of the gospel? You've sinned against God. There needs to be an atonement for your sin. Jesus is that atonement. I mean, they're already prepared to hear that because in their religions, whatever they were, how misguided they were, uh, they still had those notions and could understand a preacher coming to them saying, hey, you've sinned against this God, but Jesus is your salvation because he gave his life in your place. That all works. They're prepared to hear about the true God and the true atonement for sin because, in a sense, of the things they already believed. And by the way, when we told them that the Son of God died and rose again for us, they were also able to understand that because they probably already believed something like that. They already had in their mind this notion of a resurrected God whose resurrection was somehow important for you. So coming along here and telling them about Jesus, they have something in their head that they can use to help them understand that. I consider it preparatory work, just like the Greek language and Roman roads and Jewish synagogues. I don't view it as being any different. In the providence of God, he prepared the way for the gospel in this sense. So why does the gospel look something like these old myths? Easy. The hand of God lowering mountains and straightening roads for his son. It's just another part of that. You know, this is God in his providence doing things beyond what you would even expect God to do. But I think that makes sense given where we know history was going with the name of Jesus being proclaimed to every nation. Now I have another explanation for this that again works alongside the other one. The second explanation is humanistic, so focusing on humanity, you know, what is a human? What does a human want? Uh, so here it is. My second explanation is humanistic in that all those pagan myths reveal something about human needs. You can learn something about people by the stories they tell and the things they believe, and that's the case here as well with all these stories about a resurrected God. We need to follow the breadcrumb trail back to the heart of things and ask, 
What is actually going on? Why do they tell this story? So for some reason, as we think about this, humans invented myths about gods dying and rising from the dead. You know, we saw it in Egypt, we saw it in Sumer, we saw it in Greece. I mean, for some reason, this was a, consist a consistent trend in some of the uh, oldest and most regarded civilizations of the world. Humans inventing myths about gods dying and rising from the dead. And it's not enough to say that these myths are so common because nations copied each other. You might say that. You might say that, well, you know, the Egyptians had this myth about Osiris, the Sumerians copied it in their myth about Tammuz, and uh, the Greeks copied it when they made their myth about Dionysius. You could say that, but that's not really a good explanation because then you're just moving the question to another question. Why copy that story? Because the Egyptians had all kinds of myths that didn't get copied by anyone else. Same with the Sumerians, same with the Greeks. Not every myth gets copied, all right? Some myths are very much tied to their nations, but some are more common, and this is one of them. Why this one? Why was the resurrected God story so common among ancient humans? To word that differently, why do humans need to believe that some God has died and risen in some sense for us? Why do people need to believe that? Why do they tell stories about that to each other? What's going on there? The widespread nature of this myth tells me that we all have something within us that craves a God like that. And if we don't have a God like that, we'll make up a God like that. Because for some reason, we need that kind of God. That's the best conclusion I can reach, that in short, God created us to desire his resurrected son. And we are always reaching out for that. And if we can't lay hands on Jesus himself, then we'll make up Osiris or whoever. You know, we'll, we'll fill the void somehow. That seems to be the explanation that makes sense of all of this. So why does the gospel look something like these old myths? Again, easy. God created us with a desire for what he would do later, raising Jesus from the dead. You know, you hear the, uh, the, uh, the adage that people have a God-shaped hole in their heart. You know, sometimes people talk about it that way when they're talking to people about the gospel. Well, we could say that we have a, how do I word this, a resurrected God-shaped hole in our hearts. And Jesus is supposed to fill that, but if you don't have Jesus, what do you do? Well, you make it up. And just to throw this out there for you, you know, eventually our, our society kind of moved past gods and even past the true God. Superman has a resurrection story, okay? If you go back to the comics, even some of the movies, Superman has a resurrected story. Why? Why does Superman have a resurrection story? Food for thought, isn't it? It seems like people need that kind of story. And again, if they don't have it, if they, if they reject all the old pagan myths and they reject the gospel of Christ, they still need that story. So, hey, Superman, you're in. Like, why do people do that? Well, it shows something very real about us from the very interior of our hearts. Somehow we need that story. And we need it because God put it there. And he put it there in preparation for the gospel. Well, I have one more observation, uh, one more explanation, excuse me. And again, this one goes along with the other two, so you don't have to choose. They all work together. My third explanation is prophetic, in that our hopes are fulfilled by the true resurrection of the true Son of God. So prophetic in the sense of looking forward to some kind of hope that you believe is going to happen and you're waiting for it, well, Jesus is that, of course, but I want to talk about it from a different angle, from the perspective of these old pagan myths that we've been talking about. I said earlier that humans, for some reason, need to believe that some God has died and risen in some sense for us, right? That seems to be, based on what I'm seeing from ancient mythology, it seems like we need that. So the question is, why do we need that? You know, we need that belief so badly that in the absence of the gospel, we invent stories about resurrected gods. Why do we do that? You know, why really? You know, I said that, you know, God created us with that desire. But okay, how does that actually work from maybe human reasoning? You know, how do humans think about that? And why do humans gravitate toward that? Well, here's the thing. I, I would like to suggest this. 
we humans face death, right? Isn't that kind of the number one thing, the one thing that is universal to all humanity? We face death. And death is a certain, sudden, and soul-crushing reality, right? It can come out of nowhere. You know it's coming. You don't know when. It's going to come out of nowhere. And then when that happens, it is just devastating. And if you're the one who's, who loves someone who has died, that is just absolutely awful. And if you're the one that dies, your friends and family grieve for you, right? That's how death is. That's how it works. It is perhaps the most terrible thing that we can think of. And in the face of death, what we really want is sympathy, right? You know, that's whenever we're grieving about anything, right? We want someone, we want to know that somebody cares. We want someone to be there who cares for us. And death is no different. I mean, that's really the thing that rides behind the whole concept of having a funeral or a memorial service. It's kind of our in way of institutionalizing the sympathy that we want in the face of death. But we need sympathy the most from one person in particular, and that person is the person that seems to be in charge of when we die and how we die, and that is God, right? God is the one overall. He's sovereign over everything. You know, we need to know whenever death happens that God himself has some degree of sympathy for that. We need to know that. We need to know that the God who appoints our death or the death of others does so with his own tears and as a grieving friend rather than some terrible monster just trying to afflict us. Because there are people that get to that point, you know, the, the whole why God, why mentality whenever someone has died. I mean, that's a very real thing. And if you don't believe that God actually cares about you, your death, other people's death, you can have that kind of hostile reaction. Instead, you need to know that God himself is sympathetic toward death. And what better way to know that God feels sorrow of his own at death than for God himself to taste death? What if God himself experienced it? You know, because then death looks very different. It's not just God afflicting you with some terrible thing from above, you know, while he sits smugly in heaven. If God himself enters into death somehow, then death takes on an entirely different shape. And you can at least believe that God is with you in those times and that God cares. But it's more than that even. You know, more than just knowing that God cares about us and loves us in the face of death. We also need to know, know that there's a hope beyond death. We need to know that there is something else beyond death, something else that is good, you know, at least this good, maybe even better. We need, in, in a sense, life after death, right? But who can show us the way to that? You know, who could possibly show us that? Uh, when death is such an unforgiving force, it seems so final, right? The finality of it. Who can break that wall? Who can get us beyond that to see something beyond death, something we can look forward to? something that we can hope in. Well, who better to show us that than our God? And if God dies and rises from the dead, we have someone who can be like a beacon ahead of us showing us the way into something that is not this cruel end, but something that might actually be blessed and glorious. So again, why does the gospel look something like these old myths? Well, Again, I think it's actually somewhat easy when you look at it backwards from the gospel. Those old myths reflect the old hope that we've had from the beginning. You know, a hope fulfilled for us in the gospel of a dying and rising Christ. You know, we hope that God, you know, has sympathy for us in our death. And we hope that God has something good in store for us, even after death. Well, all that hope that we had, all the hope that they had back then, gets fulfilled when a man actually walks out of his tomb and his gospel goes forth to the rest of the world. So looking at it that way, it makes sense for these ancient myths to be sort of this, I guess you could say maybe a preemptive echo of the gospel. So instead of an echo that follows afterward, it's an echo that comes first. Now, as you may recall, uh, this whole sermon began with a skeptical claim, right? Something a claim that unbelievers have made. This whole sermon began with a claim that the resurrection of Christ is not worthy of our faith, right? It's like, ah, oh, why would I believe in Jesus? I might as well believe in Tammuz or Dionysius or Osiris or one of those gods. 
That's kind of the way they have. But now, I hope I've given you maybe more reason to see that the resurrection of Christ is worthy of our faith. There is something here very much at work in the world before Jesus even came that kind of heralds his coming even before he shows up, which just adds a greater weight and a solemnity to this whole gospel of Jesus rising from the dead. Now, if this were a different sermon, I could argue this point in different ways, that the resurrection of Christ is worthy of our faith. But for today, just based on what I have been saying, I will give you three reasons that the resurrection of Christ is worthy of our faith. So just very much limited to this whole idea of you know, comparing and contra contrasting Jesus to these dying and rising gods from mythology. So first, in the resurrection of Jesus, we see God at work on an ancient international scale, even before Jesus came. Now, certainly that is true. To say that God has been at work on an ancient international scale, we can say that based on everything following the resurrection, right? I mean, after all, how many people today are celebrating Easter and in how many countries? And for how long have they been celebrating this year after year? I mean, God has certainly been at work. That in itself shows the gospel to be great, the, the, severe, the severe magnitude of how many people have been worshiping Christ in this way. But the fact is we can see the hand of God at work even before the resurrection of Jesus, leading up to the resurrection of Jesus in the ways that I've described. God has created us to desire a divine resurrection and then kind of left us to feel that for several centuries and then gave us Jesus who totally stole the show from Osiris and Tammuz and Dionysius and all the other false gods people were worshiping. Many nations have manifested that desire in the myths that they created, and many nations have now experienced the joy of having the reality of Christ and his resurrection. And since God has overall, uh, he has preserved that for us so we can learn it and know the truth of it, you know, that God intended a great resurrection from the beginning. Yeah, we still know about Osiris. We know about Tammuz. We know about Dionysius. We know about these other gods. But we know about them, I think, because God wants us to look at that and see that God was already at work kind of preparing the way for Jesus even before he came. So we see God at work on an ancient international scale, which just makes the gospel of Jesus all the more worthy of belief. Secondly, in the resurrection of Jesus, we experience peace with God. And of course, this is a common theme, but I'm coming at it again from a rather different angle based on what we've been saying. I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons that people uh, want to believe in a dying and rising God was that such an event would prove that God sympathizes with death and intends a purpose for it. That he's not just up in heaven throwing down thunderbolts, killing us for no good reason, but that death means something and is even so important that God himself enters into it. Now, perhaps a skeptic will take everything I've said and argue that it's all kind of wishful thinking. You know, people believing what they want to believe so they can feel better. You know, they want to, they want to feel better when someone has died, and so they kind of create this whole mythology and eventually the gospel saying, oh, yeah, well, the gods taste death as well, uh, so there's your comfort. They might argue that way, but the fact is no one can argue with experience. And this is where I think the gospel comes forth with a lot of its power. Christians have testified for 2,000 years that peace with God and peace in the face of death are possible and very real through the resurrection of Jesus. Many are the stories of people on their deathbed just freaking out because they don't want to die. And many are the stories of Christians going to their death with joy and peace on account of Christ. And you can say that's all wishful thinking, but it's experience. It is what Christians actually experience. And claims of wishful thinking only go so far. I mean, death tends to strip away illusions that we might have, but this one seems strong even in the face of death. Peace with God and peace in the face of death are very real as testified by Christian experience. The unbeliever can face death at best with a kind of grim resolve. Uh, usually they greet their deaths with a great amount of resentment and sorrow and fear. 
but it takes a believer to embrace the day of our death as a good plan from a loving God and make peace with all of it. And we see that certainly in the gospel. And if these ancient pagan myths are representative of the idea of what the gospel actually made real, then so much the better. That just shows that all of that is very much true from the beginning before Jesus shows up and that Jesus just made it real and actual. Well, finally, in the resurrection of Jesus, we find fulfillment of hope for life beyond death. And again, this ties in with things that I have been saying. This is the other reason I suggested why ancient people wanted so badly to believe in a resurrected God. You know, to have hope that there is something more beyond death. And if the God you worship has actually walked that way, you have all the more reason to believe in it. And again, a very stubborn unbeliever might call that wishful thinking. Oh yes, of course, people want to believe that death is not the end. So they make up their stories about God's dying and rising from the dead to give themselves that sense of hope. But if we believe that a flesh and blood man walked out of his tomb and that other people bore witness to it and that no enemy was able to prove them wrong, then the answer is settled. I mean, if that actually happened, if Jesus actually did walk out of that tomb and all the rest happened as we believe it happened, then the claim of wishful thinking just isn't any good. I mean, this isn't wishful thinking. This is historical fact. And that makes our hope very much real. So yeah, you have these you know, myths of these resurrected gods coming along and the hope that they promise, but then that hope becomes real in the flesh and blood resurrection of Jesus, which again, I think is a historical fact you can't easily wave away. Now, although I could multiply reasons, these three reasons are enough, I think, to make the resurrection of Christ very worthy of belief. And not despite all the ancient similar myths about resurrected gods, but even perhaps because of them, that even in that, you know, though that is the very, very much the darkness of paganism, you know, God is still God overall and still working out his work and making ready for Christ. And then Christ came, which is what we're celebrating today as we celebrate the anniversary of his resurrection. So not for no reason do we call Jesus the desire of all the nations. Uh, that is something that we say about Jesus, but again, uh, today I think there's another dimension to that, that maybe we need to add into it as we think about the mythology that people had and how Jesus uh, comes in and does better than all of them and totally takes their place in his own resurrection. The nations, it seems, desired him even when they did not realize they desired him. And for what it's worth, they knew what they needed. And in a sense, they testify along with us that Christ is the reality. You know, we've seen that today somewhat as I've interacted with this very specific objection that people have had uh, to the gospel. And I hope you've seen that. Let me go through and give you a summary like I always do, and then we'll be done and we'll move into our meal time. So first I explain that unbelievers occasionally criticize the resurrection of Jesus for being a retelling of older myths. And I described the myths about a few of these gods, uh, all of which had some kind of resurrection ascribed to them. But then I also mentioned these unbelievers who make this objection fail to notice all the important facts about Jesus. So in this case, they fail to remember the very Jewish idea of a general resurrection. They forget the historical flavoring of Christ's own resurrection. And finally, uh, the unexpected result of his resurrection uh, in that it's the only resurrection believed everywhere. Uh, those are very important facts that they seem to forget. And then thirdly, I suggested that if we view the resurrection of Jesus with an open mind, we can give better explanations of these ancient myths. I suggested that God intended all these myths to do some preparation work for the gospel, but also that they show a desire created within us for a resurrected God, a desire which God fulfills in Christ. And then based on that, I argue that the resurrection of Jesus is worthy of our faith for all those reasons that I just gave you. All right, well, that is what I had to share with you today. Uh, next time, we'll be back in the Gospel of Matthew, which at this point has really turned into a study of the Lord's Supper. Uh, so there's plenty of sermons on that coming. We'll get back onto that the next time I teach, which will probably be in May. Uh, nonetheless, uh, that is what I have for you today today.
If there are questions or comments, we can hear those and then we can get ready for our meal today.